Hey there, and welcome back to XCOM 2. My name is Pete, and today we complete another episode of our Legend Iron Man walkthrough of XCOM 2 War of the Chosen. As you might already be able to hear, I am currently a bit under the weather, so forgive me if my voice sounds a bit nasal today. I am recovering from a slight cold, and this is most likely what I'm going to sound like for the next few days. Either way, that should not distract us from the episode at hand. Last time we left off, after what was an explosive adventure, we successfully completed another supply raid mission and finally began the construction of the Proving Ground. Today we might be facing our next Guerrilla Ops mission, or something else the game has in mind for us. To get us started though, we'll continue to scan at the Skirmisher HQ. After all, we want to get those construction projects finished quickly. The results of our breakthrough were quite fascinating. Alright, and with that, the improved shotguns research project has been completed. And that means all of our shotguns now receive a permanent plus one damage bonus. Now that's just lovely, especially combined with the Hunter's Instinct damage bonus we unlocked in the Guerrilla Tactics School. And also lovely is the fact that we just received another inspiration, resulting in the alien data cache decryption here now being a bit faster than usual. First of all though, I think this here is what we will be going with. Looks like we have collected enough purifiers for the autopsy to now be instant, so let's start with that and then we'll most likely follow it up with the inspiration. After a careful examination of the specialized advent unit identified as the purifier, I have found clear evidence of genetic modification to the subject's thermoregulatory glands. These changes, in conjunction with their specialized armor, give the purifiers an impressive heat tolerance bordering on total immunity. Alright, now for a change this unlocks a passive upgrade that we don't actually have to manufacture. Instead, all armor vest utility items have just received a plus one health bonus. For the time being, this only applies to the nanoscale vest, which we haven't really bothered with yet, but in the future we will unlock more of these items and this might come in handy. Up next then, we will in fact tackle the data cache decryption. With the research time reduced from 6 down to 4 days, I think this makes some sense. And this will give us a healthy pile of intel, not that we desperately need it. I will send word as soon as we have something of note. And with that, let's continue scanning. As always, the Skirmish HQ remains our target. Against the Elders, we find nothing but success. Alright, we have completed another covert action and we have gained a free resistance contact. Ranger Warhawk has also increased his mobility further, but I would have to say the contact here is the main prize, and now we have to choose which one to go after next. A new chance to disrupt the Elder's plans has presented itself, and my followers are eager to proceed. Right, so after the recent monthly supply drop, the list here has refreshed, and there are quite a few interesting things currently on it. We could, for example, help ourselves to another resistance contact, we could also recruit an engineer, or we could unlock the very valuable improved pistols research. For the time being though, I think we will continue to hunt the Hunter, simply to unlock another resistance order slot in time for the next month, and also because the Hunter is basically controlling every single region we are currently operating in, making him by far the most annoying chosen at the moment. And so this will be our squad, Warhawk will head back out again right away, Van Dyke will come with him to grab the hacking reward, and Sharpshooter Radonis will negate the risk of capture and hopefully gain some XP in the process. They will now be away for 14 days, which might hurt us a bit, as Warhawk and Van Dyke are top tier personnel, but I also think that they are just the right man for this job. We will work hand in hand with our new allies. And with that, let's keep scanning. After all, we barely have one week left until the proving ground is done. Alright, it appears today's mission has arrived in the form of a transmission from the Resistance, and this one will take us to East Africa where we will need to neutralize an advent target. Successfully doing so would earn us some supplies as well as a healthy amount of intel, so I would say let's assemble our squad and get going. Setting course for the East African sector. Right, so this is our squad for today, the four base classes are represented, Mox comes with us too, and we bring a second ranger in Helleborus, the simple reason being that we could use another scout. Before we get going then, let's upgrade Alyssa's sniper rifle with an autoloader. Last time we did that already, but for one with a regular scope, this one here has an advanced scope though, for a 5% higher aim bonus. Now, without a Reaper, our scouting options are somewhat limited, even with two Rangers, so we'll head over to Engineering and purchase a Battle Scanner here. We can actually use this device twice per mission, and I think that should be enough. 
We are also spending some supplies and alloys to upgrade the specialist's gremlin to Mark II. So Shwaminion now receives a plus 20 bonus to his hacking stat, and 8 protocol is also slightly improved. In terms of items then, we'll put the battle scanner on Helleborus. Shwaminion, by the way, is carrying Frostbomb and Medkit. And with that, I think we're good to go, so let's see how this one plays out. Ranger deployed. We're in the pipe. Five by five. The aliens are moving a VIP of some importance through this area on board an advent transport vehicle. And the target is apparently valuable enough that the spokesman has asked us to intervene. We're moving to capture or kill the VIP. Secure the area and neutralize any hostile resistance. Menace 1 5, target location confirmed. Move to engage. Eliminate all hostile contacts. Alright, this car over here, this is where our target will be hiding. And the objective in the top left corner already says it we need to capture or kill them. Ideally, though, we pick the first of the two options. We also have concealment, so at least the first of the three to four enemy groups should be ambushable. Apart from that, we also have a 12 turn mission timer, after which we will be forced to retreat, but I have to say, considering the size of the map, that is quite generous, 12 turns should be plenty. So let's get to it here and start scouting with Pretel Mox, who can use his free grappling action to get himself onto the high ground. Repositioning. And in doing so, he immediately detects the first group of enemies, two sectoids and a spectre, a healthy amount of hit points, but especially in the case of the sectoids, nothing too dangerous, and who knows, perhaps we're lucky and they drop back down from the roof, which would give us some lovely high ground aiming bonuses. For the moment, we can also take note of a potentially hackable advent watchtower, and then continue to put everyone in position, there is absolutely no need to rush this, so we'll get as close as we can here without risking detection. Helleborus, meanwhile, strays a bit away from the group. If we break concealment, he won't be revealed anyway, while Mox can actually inch even closer and then go on overwatch. Right, looks like our enemies love the high ground just as much as we do, as they do move quite a bit closer towards Mox's position, but with our skirmisher hidden behind cover, he is not yet revealed. Now, the way I see it, we have two possible approaches here. The first one would be to throw a frost bomb with Shwaminion. Yes, that would use the item early, but also freezes all three enemies, which should then allow us to quickly dispose of them. Now, the other option, and that is the one that we'll go with, is to use a grenade. Not only can Nicholas hit all three enemies here, but the grenade would also blow up the floor underneath them, so our enemies would be receiving additional fall damage, and in turn, we would get high ground aiming bonuses for the rest of our squad. Grenade out! Right, so that was a grand total of 22 points of damage from a single grenade, and even though our enemies now quickly seek cover, we should be able to take them out. The only issue might be that sectoid in the back, because we don't want to move too close to them. Keep in mind that we have one enemy guaranteed to be around that car, and they, as well as whoever else is around, have a good chance of spotting whoever comes near. So then, let's get to it and we'll start things off by just making a few simple moves. Mox and Shwaminion can get into good shooting positions while Ranger Starfall flanks the Spectre. And then we'll start things off with Mox and an 81% against the Sectoid in the back. We take from the Elder Stock. Lovely, that's the kill and that basically ends the fight already. Because as you can see, despite half cover, Shwaminion's shot here is guaranteed. There you go. And finally, we can see our recently obtained 1 point shotgun damage increase in action, as Starfall is now guaranteed to hit for at least 8 points of damage, and that's just the amount of hit points the Spectre has left. I got it, right? Right, and that's our first enemy group taken out, so nice and easy. And with Starfall's bonus movement action, we can then even grab the loot, which turns out to be 2 Illyrium cores as well as an advanced hat trigger, definitely not too shabby for one enemy. Now, as I've noted, Ranger Helleborus has remained concealed, so he can now stealthily move up a bit further and then throw the battle scanner, as we want to get a clearer picture of what exactly we have waiting for us down by that car. Ooh. 
right. So we have some civilians on the right, the VIP right next to the car, and then what seems to be three advanced troopers. Nothing too terribly difficult, I would say, especially considering that we can come at them from above. So that rooftop that Mox and Hellebore is already standing on, that is where we want everyone to be. On this turn though, we can only get Sapphire West next to the ladder, but it looks like our enemies are not making any moves, at least none that our battle scanner picks up. At the beginning of our next turn then, we already lose visibility again. So again, even stealth and a battle scanner are no match for a reaper. Thankfully though, knowing where our enemies are, we can quickly catch them again. VIP in Schlepp. Target identity confirmed. Menace 1-5. Remember, we're here to capture the VIP if possible. Knock them out and bring them in. Right, so we officially have line of sight with our VIP and we are introduced to the Subdue ability, a unique action that we can take to knock them out without killing them, which then allows us to capture them instead of having to kill them. And capturing them, that is what we want to do, as that is the only way for us to receive that intel reward that was promised. However, doing so could become a bit more complicated, as we have also just spotted a third enemy group. You may have briefly spotted them too, a Spectre, a Stun Lancer and a Purifier standing right next to the evac zone. Now once again, they are one height level further down than the troopers, so elevation is definitely playing in our favor here. Still, those troopers do have line of sight to those roof tiles that are closest to them, and with the rest of our squad already revealed, we therefore want to stay back a bit, just so we can get everyone up here first and then engage the enemies on our terms. What's over there? Once again then, our enemies don't make a move, at least the troopers don't. Sadly, we don't have permanent line of sight to the other group. Moving up as far as we can with Heavy Nicholas, we can also see a grenade here will sadly not quite do the trick. If we use one, we ideally need to launch it past the car, otherwise that could blow up and kill the VIP. I'm going. So, what we will do instead now is try a bit of hacking with Schwerminion. We have two advent watchtowers on the map, and just so you're aware, both of them offer the same rewards. The one down here though does so with a slightly better success chance, and so we will now hopefully be able to take control of an enemy unit for two whole turns. Alright, that more than succeeds, and as a result we gain control of an advent trooper right next to the VIP. In the process, we also learn of the presence of a heavily armored turret, but this should now give us a lovely chance to cause some confusion among the enemy ranks. Now, unfortunately, this works just like enemy mind control, we can't act with our new soldier just yet. Instead, they will be fully controllable at the beginning of the next turn. Moving to Overwatch. Fire shots. Got it covered. Watch order Come confirmed. Get some. Menace 1-5, be advised, hostile interceptors are inbound on your current position. Firebrand has a limited window to provide extraction. Right, so here we are then, at the beginning of that next turn, and as you can see, we have full control over our advent trooper here. Now, unfortunately, despite the fact that they are an advanced trooper, they still have pretty poor aim, so even a flanking shot here would only have a 70% hit chance. Combined with the fact that their rifle only does 5 points of damage, I think a grenade is the better option. We also want to make sure to hit ourselves here, just to make things easier down the line, and we even get rid of some enemy armor. And no, I have no idea why the two troopers here suddenly have armor, usually it does not just simply appear on them in the middle of the mission. Either way, after a quick glimpse at the third enemy group down below, our two troopers now seek cover, and with the part officially active, we can move in. A 10 battal. And we'll start things off with Mox here, who has an 81% success chance to use Justice and to yank the trooper here out of their full cover. Face Justice. Top stun dropping! That succeeds and they are now even stunned for two turns. With the upgraded Ionic Ripjack, there is now a 25% chance for this to occur. I'm trusting you here. That also means that we can focus the rest of our attention on the other trooper, although Ranger Starfall can quickly take care of them with a height advantage flanking shot. Absolutely. The rest of the squad then moves in a bit closer and Sapphire West can hopefully help herself to another kill here. There really is no need to wait until the trooper's stun wears off. Get eliminated. 
I'm going. To end our turn, then we go on Overwatch, and you might already notice one mistake we made earlier, and that was to not move our mind control trooper away from the car. So, the one thing that had to happen does happen, the turret takes aim but misses, and instead it hits the car, which will now blow up on the next turn. If it does, the VIP will be dead, and unfortunately the guy is not smart enough to move away on his own, so we will now have to intervene, and this could get dangerous. First things first, we'll have to burn the turret's overwatch, and our trooper seems to be good at dodging. Unfortunately though, this does not really help the situation, as the third enemy group is now revealed and also activates. And on top of it all, we can't even use the trooper to knock out the VIP. I had hoped for that to be possible, but honestly I wasn't sure if it was. So instead, let's take aim at the stun lancer, against the turret we sadly can't do much. Right, so that misses, and regardless, the VIP remains our priority target. However, the Spectre is definitely the main threat at the moment, so let's take a shot with Shumin in here and see if we can't do some damage. Okay, absolutely crucial stun against the Spectre here, despite only a 20% chance, and still, we are not really in the clear just yet. Set him up, knock him down. You see, the problem is that knocking out the VIP costs an action, which means, thanks to run and gun, Ranger Starfall is the only one actually close enough to do so. Status confirmed. Target package in custody. Right, so that knocks out the VIP, but doesn't actually get them away from the car. In order to achieve that, we now need to dash in with Mox, getting rid of all of his actions, and then giving him one extra action off of Nicholas's teamwork. No retreat! Using this, Mox can now pick up the VIP, which is thankfully a free action, I will bear it. and then carry them to safety behind full cover against the turret. Now, one more small problem is the fact that our controlled trooper will turn hostile again on the next turn, so it might be a good idea to take them out before that happens, as the car explosion likely won't take care of them entirely. And thankfully, after Nicholas misses the shot, Helleborus delivers, and no, don't worry, this will not void the achievement we could get for finishing the entire campaign without losing a soldier. Du warst kein Gegner für mich. Sie sehen mich. Although, whether or not we're able to, still hangs very much in the balance. And you might already see the problem coming up here, Ranger Starfall is completely out of moves, so let's hope that he can dodge that turret in the same way the trooper could. Transport inbound on your current position. Right, good day to be wearing Predator armor, I'd say. This was definitely an unfortunate chain of events, not necessarily made better by the fact that the turret landed a critical, and of course, Advent also picks this exact moment to send in reinforcements. Still, with those not being able to attack us on their first turn, and with the Spectre also still stunned, I think the turret has to go. Sporting 5 points of armor though, that's not an easy task, so let's burn through some of that with Nicholas's grenade here, even though it will kill a civilian too. Now, I think the civilian casualty on this type of mission will remain without consequences. Still, it doesn't really help make the mission feel any better. At the very least, then, Helleborus delivers for four more points of damage, and if we're lucky, Mox can land the killing blow. Unfortunately, putting down the VIP actually costs him an action, so he can only fire once. I am the victim. Still, once is enough and the turret is thankfully gone. As a result, Mox also receives a well-earned promotion, while Sharpshooter West can continue to go to town on the Stun Lancer. The guy is on Overwatch after all and might just complicate things even further. Neutralized. With the overwatch removed, we can then move Starfall into a flanking position and hopefully get some revenge. I guess that'll be okay. Nine points of damage here would already do the trick. 
Instead, he deals 13 and can now even move again afterwards, and let's send him back a bit just to stay away from the purifier, and then we'll go on Overwatch and look forward to even more enemies. Right, so here we go, purifier, trooper and officer. Let's see who draws reaction fire first. I've got eyes on an admin position. down, thousands to go. Okay, so Shwaminian delivers again, killing the officer and earning himself a promotion too. The second purifier then also appears on the scene, but is out of moves to do anything. And that leaves us with what I assume to be the final three enemies on this map. And it looks like, despite everything we have experienced so far, this should be manageable. So, first things first, let's move in with Nicholas and take aim against the armored purifier. If he hits, his shredder ability should do some good work here. Following that, we then send down Helleboros to take a flanking shot against the trooper, and thanks to our upgrades, one-shot kills are actually pretty likely at this point. And that's the kill, lovely, Alyssa should have another one against the purifier here, unless XCOM once again does us dirty. It doesn't, and that leaves only purifier number two, this one without armor, and also not the advanced version, so only sporting six mega hit points. Sadly though, Starfall comes up short and only deals one compensation point of damage, so let's get Mox involved, who can quickly grapple himself behind the purifier, and with a minimum damage of five points, the kill is guaranteed. Alright, and with that we're clear, although I wasn't 100% sure of it at this point. I think for the sake of my voice we can skip ahead to the end here though. No more enemies showed up, and with three turns left on the timer, we eventually moved everyone, including the VIP, into the evac zone. VIP secure and in position for evac. That is confirmed. Mission accomplished. This is Firebrand. VIP is secure. And there we are, all things considered, still a pretty good mission. Predator armor definitely saved the life of one of our people here today though, and after losing two thirds of his hit points, I'm hoping that we won't have to miss Starfall for too long. Unlike in the first game, damage done to armor is not actually taken into account in this one, so as soon as they suffer even one point of damage, our soldiers have to recover, and well, Starfall suffered quite a bit more than that. I would like to assure the citizens of Advent that our peacekeepers will stop at nothing to prevent further attacks by criminal elements such as the one that occurred today. The elders have total faith in our ability to overcome any and all threats to our peace. I can't imagine the aliens are too happy about this one, Commander. Hell of a job. Alright, good news first, our ranger will only miss 13 days, I think that is on the low end for being gravely wounded. He will most likely miss only one or two missions. Promotion wise then we'll go with Shominion and the choice here is an easy one, we'll go with Field Medic. Using a medkit in this mission here wasn't actually necessary, I felt like we had things well under control near the end, but in the future we might not get so lucky. That brings us to Mox, who once again receives a random XCOM skill at this rank, and it is Volatile Mix, a plus two damage bonus for all grenades. This could actually be somewhat useful, especially to strip away larger layers of armor, but for now I think Mox is better served focusing on shooting and grappling. We will also not go with full throttle, giving him a plus two mobility bonus every time he kills something, simply because Mox doesn't really have the damage output to consistently kill things with one shot, and also because this really only gets useful against the lost, but then it can get somewhat ridiculous. Still, for now we are going with Whiplash, an entirely free attack action. We can only use this once per mission, but it does 6 points of damage, which is doubled against max, so it is close to an insta-kill button against any early game mechanoid we encounter. In terms of loot then, nothing apart from the Illyrium cores and the hat trigger was gained, except of course for the enemy VIP, Femi Makuba, nicknamed Bones. Submitted, as always, by a lovely patron supporter in the naming rights to end above, this one going by the nickname J-Line, who also sent in the following character biography. Femi's parents were killed by the aliens. Now he is out for revenge and collects the bones of his enemies, earning him his nickname. 
Unfortunately though, it looks like Femi did ultimately run over to the alien side, or maybe he was working as an undercover agent. Either way, his capture earns us 107 units of intel. Excellent work, Commander. Your efforts continue to bolster the resistance movement across the globe. Alright, and with that, we now actually have more intel than we have supplies. So I would say up next on our list is making contact with a few more regions, although for the moment the Avatar project is not moving, and thanks to a useful resistance order, making contact is actually done instantly right now. So I don't think we need to do it right away, especially not with another engineer popping up here. Seven days, we will definitely take that, especially since the choice for our next guerrilla ops will most likely be entirely based on the dark event we can counter, as there is one that definitely stands out as worse than the rest. When inspired, our team is actually quite efficient. Right, so the alien data cache decryption is done and with that we receive even more intel. 122 units of it to be exact. So at this point we are absolutely swimming in the stuff. Now, with no further breakthroughs or inspirations, we now have two research options here and I would like to hear your opinion. Our next project will either be Illyrium or Psionics. Illyrium is required to eventually unlock Plasma Weapons, the next and highest tier of weapons in the game, something we definitely want to work towards eventually, but I think our current beam weapons will serve us nicely for at least a little while longer. Psionics, meanwhile, would unlock, as the name suggests, psionic abilities, and in XCOM 2 those are actually reserved for an entirely new class, the Psy Operatives, which I think we should introduce sooner rather than later. However, the facility where we can actually train them is rather power hungry, so even though unlocking this only takes 15 days, we would likely not be able to build that facility as soon as the project is done. So essentially, we have two pretty interesting research paths in front of us, with good arguments to be made against both. So I turn to you and would like to know what you think we should do next. Let me know in the comments down below and then we'll begin the next episode by making that decision. For today then, I think we have reached a good point to make the cut, so as always, if you have enjoyed the episode, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.